in five, four, three, two, and one. And welcome everyone to this episode of the Real Leaders Podcast. Four, three, two, one. Welcome, good people. And thanks for hanging on to the Real Leaders Podcast. I'm your host, Kevin Edwards. Joining us today is Trammell Crow Jr., the founder of EarthX. Trammell, a pleasure having you on the show today. Thank you very much. So, Trammell, I'm just going to take a, a look at the resume here. I see uh, we've got some family in real estate development. I see we're a Dallas, Dallas conservative here. Um, and then I see yeah, Dallas all my life. En- en- environmental activists. So I, I'm, I'm a little, I'm a little, uh, you know, excuse me, I'm a little confused here, Trammell. How does this story go? What got you into activism and the founding of EarthX? You're confused because you're thinking of the the blanket generalizations and stereotypes of people in Dallas, Texas. Must be. Which are only partly true. Uh, uh, Mine's a simple story. I learned the word environment when I was 12 years old and it stuck. (laughs) Simple as that. Back in the 60s uh, when it was uh, in the air. You know, it was, it was a new thing. It was building up to Earth Day. So I was a product of that time. So just the word environment got you triggered to be an environmentalist? Explain that. Just the word environment. When my brother taught me the word environment when I was 12, it stuck. It was immediately, to me, the most important thing because the problems were evident. You could read them in, in, in the big pictures in the Saturday Evening Post and in Life magazine. And uh, it was uh, clear to me that that was the overall prevailing issue without which all other problems could not be solved. What were your interactions with the environment, Trammell? Were you an outdoor guy? Were you, I, I realize you're in your no. state. You must be. What, what's, what's the connection? No, I was, I was strictly a suburban kid. And then I became a real estate developer and raped the land. Uh, 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 studied a little bit up in college. Came back to Dallas and went to work. Got married. And, you know, like I think a lot of us do. I'm not trying to let myself off the hook. Our, our, uh, our hopes to what we'll the good we can do someday, particularly when you have an inheritance, is that, that it'll be someday. And, and my thought was more like when I, when I make something out of myself and make my own money, then I can uh, be philanthropic about it. Uh, so I didn't become an environmental activist. I was like many people uh, uh, don't realize they amount to nothing more than an armchair environmentalist. You know, commenting and observing, and not really taking on the burden themselves. So, what's uh, what's Thanksgiving dinner like for your family? Then you've got all these real estate developers, and then uh, here's Trammell starting one of the largest uh, environmental events in, in in the world on Earth Day. Well, uh, ten years ago, it was uh, out of left field. Uh, it did not resonate with the audience here, uh, but we did have in the first year, 200 what I call exhibitors, environmental groups, corporations that have environmental initiatives and so forth, and 38,000 people for a very serious educational expo with some films and some speakers. And it was the biggest environmental event on Earth Day in the world. And we, when we found that out, it was, it was uh, not a happy thought that, lo and behold, all we did was f- five, five months of hard work, make something so important that we continued to build. And why isn't it happening elsewhere? And I'm here to report that it has not been happening elsewhere. Uh, Earth Day is a fantastic uh, thought. Uh, it's the second most recognized secular holiday in the, in the world after New Year's. Uh, but the actual event amounts to thousands of uh, community garden, uh, excuse me, the uh, local community park affairs, coffee clutches, uh, and, and some education going on, but mainly it's kind of a community thing. Uh, conferences throughout the year of ourselves and, and, and so many, many scientific conferences. But as far as something that includes everybody, 
and the public and all environmental issues and calls to action, uh, it's a painfully uh, thin in America and, and around the world. Well, there, there's a common theme in Texas. I think everything is bigger there. So that does make sense that uh, your conference would be the biggest. But I'm curious, though, because Earth Day, you know, recent, I think it was its 50 year anniversary. So yeah. that means doing my math here it must have started in 1970. What were you doing yeah. in 1970? And and maybe explain to our audience uh, who weren't born before then, like myself, the origin behind uh, uh, Earth Day. Okay, uh, Karen, could you get a comic book out of the uh, far, far uh, go. Yeah. chest down that hall? We have made a comic book for the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. Uh, uh, the word environment was unknown. Thank you. The, the term environmentalist or environmentalism was unknown. Conservation was alive and well in America. But it was really kind of a, a, a an outdoorsy thing. Uh, farmers and ranchers and hunters and fishers were in, interested in conservation of wildlife and habitat. But things had never been so bad as in the you know in the '60s. And with Rachel Carson writing *Silent Spring* and waking everybody up to the evils of DDT, uh, rivers catching on fire, 1969, the big oil spill in Santa Barbara. So there really had to be something done. And Senator uh, Gaylord Nelson uh, had a call to action and said, we will have, he called it a teach-in. We're going to have a teach-in, just like a love-in or a sit-in, in the 60s. And uh, uh, about seven months of preparation, but without centralizing it and framing it, but leaving it very much like a 60s cultural thing open uh, to adaptation. There were, I think, 10 million people involved at that time, and that was the the greatest involvement. uh, the, the the gatherings were larger than any anti-war protests or civil rights protests during the 60s. So it caught us all by surprise. There we go. <laughs> yeah. And this is not an Archie and Betty comic book. This is a, uh, or a manga. It's a very educational thing about the forces that came together. For instance, American middle-class housewives were an integral part because they were worried about the, 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 the things they were feeding their children. Uh, uh, so the way it happened, uh, Still today, 50 years later, is a huge image, uh, Earth Day. So when a lot of people think Earth Day, a lot of people have this, you know, granola mindset. You know, you, you explained it great you know, oh. earlier. That's why you think, you know, I, yeah. I can't be passionate about the environment because I'm a Dallas businessman. You know, a, a lot of good things came out of Earth Day. And one of those things was the EPA. And who was in, <laughs> in, in office at that time actually was a Republican. Uh, Richard Nixon was in office at that time and, um, you know, created a lot of uh, government agencies to, um, you know, tackle these environmental issues that let's say capitalism or the industrial age had had created um now to you trammel uh, were you a conservationist before uh what is your image and what is the misconception of um someone who uh, cares about the environment well uh a misconception is Republican and Democrat and liberal and conservative and capitalist and socialist, the the worst environmental atrocities throughout the world have basically happened in communist countries, uh, socialist countries, Czechoslovakia, Eastern Europe, and, and now China, of course, and, and North Korea, or whatever we know about North Korea. Um, uh, the fact that it, the EPA was formed under Richard Nixon, I don't particularly uh, uh, give him credit for that. You know, uh, uh, he, he did help make it happen. It was a bipartisan thing, absolutely. And today, the problem is it has become a polarized thing. Uh, now, now I'll, I'll concede <laughs> in Dallas, we have taken the approach, like you said earlier, granola. 
from the very first uh, event, we said, we're not going to have leather uh, uh, bracelets and charms and dances. We're going to get serious. It was really just ecology. Uh, at the same time, that opened us up to all ecology, not just climate. And we've learned more and more every year that this is a good thing. There are people of all political ilks who will involve in environmentalism. They might not call it that. And I know down here in Texas, great farmer, rancher, hunter, fisher, conservationists. But as soon as you start talking climate, they'll push the chair back and stand up. <laughs> Well, that yeah, there, there's like a there's almost like a dogma on both ends of the spectrum, and it really should be apolitical. I mean, conservationists. I mean, there's an 11 percent tax on every single guns or bullets sold. A lot of people are going to cringe when I say this, but there's you know more money going into conservation efforts from hunters, from fishermen than you know nonprofits or you know uh, let's say just like the Humane Society. It's it's a you know pennies to the dollar. It's it's not even close, and it's it's not odd thing to think about like you're saving animals to then you know hunt them down again but that's been the only effective way to preserve these animals in these spaces and i'm sure i'll get a lot of flack for that but that's just what i have heard yep. now Trammell, you, you will, uh, you will get I, I will and that's okay and i agree with you in a morose kind of way i say yeah yeah because people that work with earth x have very mixed feelings and different political ideologies it's much easier to talk about it when you say in America, the white-tailed deer population is alive and healthy only because of U.S. Fish and Wildlife licenses, hunting licenses, and wardens, game wardens who are paid by that. But when you shift the argument to Africa and you talk about elephants, of which there are 450 million, uh, or rhino, not so many, the hunting system over there, no, excuse me, the preservation system, the game wardens, the only thing between extinction and the rhino, for instance, are the game wardens. And those African countries do not have any budget for game wardens except for the hunting licenses. Yep. So eh, yeah. I have mixed feelings about it too. I'm a suburban boy. I was a hunter when I was a kid, but I'm not today. Yeah, the the safari guide photo, you know, no one's going to pay $71,000 to come, you know, take a photo of an elephant, but someone that wants to kill one will. It's a really odd... And to preserve them, by the to way. To preserve them. Yeah. yeah. And it's a really interesting thing, and that's part of this why I was so excited to speak with you today, because I know that you're, uh, you know, very open to having these conversations, and I am too. Um, now, the Earth X... What is the ultimate goal of Earth X? Like when the the or we talked about the origin of Earth Day, the origin of Earth X. What's the ultimate goal, and how do you see um, the business leaders watching this, the business community um, playing a role in um, the say regression of climate change? If you, will? I'm not I'm not very good on big questions and mission statements. So obviously, logically, the end goal of Earth X is to save the world and to save it in, environmentally. <laughs> But through education, through calls to action, through recruitment, uh, it was uh, a, a disadvantage starting this in Dallas 10 years ago. But now it's a great advantage because we have built what, if it hadn't been for the COVID, we would have had 200,000 people at the event this year. And I don't know any other Earth Day uh, serious event besides a rock and roll concert that amounts to more than 10,000 people. A huge education and recruitment without preaching to the choir. Mm. Uh, uh, you know, to do this in San Francisco would not really convert so many people. We have uh, 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 mythologists who were former skeptics. I won't say denier, former skeptics. We have climatologists that uh, uh, are evangelical Christians. And when those people speak to business leaders and conservative groups, they listen. Mm. If somebody from MIT starts talking, they usually don't. It's tribal. You know, it's, we're not going to convince each other about the science. It's too embedded, like those cultural issues. Environment's a cultural issue. Immigration, guns, uh, uh, race. 
environment. So is that what you're looking for? That transformation from someone coming in who's a little skeptical and then leaves with an under, a better understanding of what's going on? Well, that's right. Simply put, it's too simply put. There are a million issues and a million approaches to it. And one of the most important things is for the general public and politicians to know that corporations are doing huge initiatives all over the world. Uh, I'll personally say not as many as they should, but the growth in that has been fantastic and the achievement has been fantastic. Rainforest, uh, monoculture, uh, trees and wood in general, we've made great strides. Now, many corporations are looking at ocean and ocean plastic, which is a public issue. Could you provide our audience with an example of something that you just mentioned, whether it's with your own family in real estate or with a corporation who's visited the event and and have made some uh, changes because of it? Uh, Well, I've had uh, grown up white European males come up to me with their Texas accents and say, Trammell. I've never been here before, and I have had an epiphany. They've used the E word, wow. and I understand now, and it really, really lets us know we're, we're doing the right thing. Uh, we have an investment forum called E-Capital Summit. We've had it for four years. Uh, we've had 50 to 90 startups, early and late stage startups in clean tech, ocean tech, ag tech, and a similar number of uh, venture capital investors and family offices attending. We've matched them up and an estimate would be uh, 50 million bucks over these four years has gone into those startups. Mm. Now, Uh, by, by having the ocean conference and the forest conference and the E capital summit all there at the same place, which never happens. And they, 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 they network, they open up each other's horizons, but, but largely it's public business politician, having Republican and a Democrat on the same stage, which they can't really do in Washington, DC, or maybe even San Francisco, but in the heart of the country it's begun. Do you see this coming from the young entrepreneurs that these, uh, you know, I would assume I've, sp- I've spoken to a few of them, probably more than most people listening to this, and yeah. they are very passionate about the environment. Now, the only thing I worry about that is not being able to go out and meet your neighbor, um, speaking with people in the communities uh, who may not agree with them. Uh, if you're a clean energy company, have you spoken with the gas and diesel company that's providing all the fuel for you know the local um, you know the local communities. Uh, do you see that being a problem in these young entrepreneurs? And what is your experience uh, with the, the, the good people at EarthX? I'd say, I'd say the, the good news is the difference in the, uh, young entrepreneurs now and 20 years ago is huge. And like we all know, millennials and the generation below them, whatever they're going to wind up being called, it's not going to be Generation Z. Uh, they'll have their own character. Uh, are just naturally uh, by by the, the the news media by what they see uh, as problems by what they see their families doing about those things you know getting a better fuelage car are just born and bred to care more about it and they do and this this great empowerment that young business people have nowadays, they, they, they know no fear. You know, they, they, the, the word mistake doesn't scare them like it was like it scared me. They really, really, uh, are improving. So Trammell, you said you got into this after the real estate. Do you wish you maybe would have started and, and dedicated your life to, um, a social enterprise or something like that? What took you so long? You know, I haven't thought about that very much. I'm not that reflective a person. Uh, But yeah, looking back on it, I think the world needs this. And I should have been an activist uh, in the nonprofit world long ago. Um, I began at uh, um, uh, age 55. But uh, hey, what the hell? What made you do it? Two businessmen came to me 
I was retired, involved in uh, civic affairs. The co-founder of Container Store and the founder of Hotel.com. The co-founder of the Container Store was a long, lanky Texan wearing a seersucker suit and a straw hat and talked like this. The the guy with Container Store was from New York and wanted to talk in bullet points. Mm. And they both cared about the same thing. Uh, The power company here was applying for a fast track approval with the governor for for a, for a, uh, 11 permits for coal-fired power plants and even the business community could see it was just a play. They didn't need to build them. They needed three. They wanted eight dirty, dirty permits to put in the top drawer and pull out 20 years later like power companies usually do and say, look at the dirty permits we've got. So we started the Texas Business for Clean Air, which is the first time there ever been the word business and clean in Texas and uh, put us a spin on this debate uh, that really would have won without us. Uh, We had about 200 leading businessmen all over the state who uh, 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 put their names on this movement and KKR and Goldman Sachs uh, bought TXU and had certain environmental uh, 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 rules when they started. It's a new day. So, Trammell, why do you know the power companies all over America? Well, not all of them, but uh, power companies all over America have uh, not gone as quickly as they should have. But now the economics makes so much sense in many parts of America that. Uh, 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 if corporations do what's right for their bottom line, and I mean their triple bottom line, they'll save the world. And if consumers and you and me and Joe Q public uh, realize that it's not just the corporation's fault, but it's how we shop and how we consume and take our own responsibility every single day. It's just two sides of the coin, isn't it? So I think we've seen that changing since 1970. Consumers are increasingly voting with their dollars for responsible companies. Uh, Let's say fair trade companies, organic companies, uh, clean packaging companies. But Mm -hmm. you just Mm -hmm. mentioned the leadership was really the sole driver of this change. They approached you, two affluent CEOs, Mm -hmm. one from New York, one from Texas, and a seersucker suit approached you uh, to drive this change. What Trammell has worked for you in the leadership standpoint of an effective uh, environmental change? Well, I'm not sure I understood the question, but uh, I uh, had done enough small things in the environmental world in Dallas, helping the U.S. Green Building Council, getting uh, paper recycling started downtown and stuff like that. That I must have had a reputation for, for green, and and they said you're the only big green businessman that we found in in the state of in the city of Dallas. Uh, so that's how I got started. But I don't think that was to your point. Well, I was just trying to make the point of is it reaching across aisles to drive the change? Is it finding people of influence to drive the change? Is it people that are well known in the community that are driving change? How do business leaders in today's day and age effectively drive change that's going to either change policies um, or influence and encourage other companies to make changes as well? Uh, If you really want to get to the essence of it, it's the political machine. Mm. I've seen CEOs of major oil companies uh, thump the chest of uh, senators Mm. saying, we want a carbon tax. We want, we just want to know what the rules are. Mm. But between misled uh, campaign funding, uh, misled corporate influence, uh, sometimes misled environmental groups who who preach this uh, 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 all or nothing uh, attitude, the system of politics and lobbying and the 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 media, the damn liberal media and the damn conservative media. Uh, doesn't really want to solve these problems. Hmm. Well, the problem- that's, why they, that's why they've bought on to clim- uh, climate and keep producing this uh, uh, merchants of doubt. Well, as long as there's uh, not 
positive 100% proof, then uh, we shouldn't go forward with climate policy, which is ridiculous. And the problems are very complex as well. Um, and I, th- I think we're all a part of this social experiment of now social media, something that wasn't a part and around in that 1970. We see right now at the Black Lives Matter, there's so many people out and about and are being told and, and are, are, are tuning in to what's going on because it's right in front of them all the time. We don't really know where it's going. Um, but there is something that I was also curious about, Trammell. Um, it was the 50th year of Earth Day, yet COVID-19 came in. And I was, I'm was i curious, did you, I'm pretty sure you you held the conference online, is that correct? Oh God, we had, we were preparing our, our whatever it was, 14 conferences, 11 banquets, uh, a huge film festival, like I said, 700 exhibitors and uh, 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 200,000 people. And we just had to cancel, but we did move about uh, eight conferences online in five weeks, not really being the technicians of this ilk, and uh, and succeeded. We also learned that a bunch of scientists that are sitting at a table does not grab the public's uh, 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 attention for very long. But it taught us whether or not we'll be able to have future gatherings. It taught us that we must go online. So we're not Earth Day Dallas like we used to be. We're not Earth Day Texas. We're Earth X and we're global. And we'll be starting with serious programming at EarthX.org in September. That's very fascinating. And now, are you still going to be an annual conference or will you make this a multiple events a year? I'd say it remains to be seen, but personally, I believe that there will be, we'll, we'll have uh, 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 conferences, gatherings, expos of different scales, and I think that we'll disseminate them uh, uh, geographically, uh, uh, depending on what happens with uh, people and their attitudes towards uh, pandemic. Pandemic. Let me let me add, this this ain't nothing new here. Uh, we've we've always had these. This is this is a a, a, a a deadly form, but it's a product of environmental degradation. Mm. And I I think well in in my world anyway, uh, people are really understanding that. Uh, breaking down the barriers between flora and fauna, and and man and the built environment uh, reduces our, our our barriers and uh, these types of things will happen and Bill Gates predicted it five years ago. So expand on that a little bit more. You said COVID is a, a result of environmental degradation. Expand on that. Uh, increased population, increased density of people, uh, proximity to uh, 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 to, to, to wildlife, um, the, uh, the, the, the loss of habitat makes a, uh, a, a weaker, uh, a barrier and puts us closer to, uh, to animals and disease and, and microbes, uh, 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 not necessarily CO2, but air pollution uh, makes us makes us weaker and more susceptible to uh, the breathing consequences. Uh, uh, they're 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 just now really studying it, but the uh, CDC uh, Center for Disease Control already has some papers out on the uh, ecological causes for covid it, it's it's strange times and it is it was i guess inspiring for me to see people you know rally together around the common goal to stay inside to not spread um when you look at the the data and the results and you say okay well there's something more existential here um it's called climate change and not that the climate hasn't been changed it's just that human factors um and businesses have uh, contributed to the increase of this climate change um do you see uh, a, a bright future ahead and what gives you um any positivity about uh, what's to come here in the the pursuing generations 
Well, <laughs> there are two types of environmentalists. <laughs> Uh, there's the technological optimist that believes uh, what, our, 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 uh, our innovations will save the world. And there's the environmental apocalyptist who thinks it's really just going to hit the hit the fan. Um, I think that there uh, there are highly imminent dangers. You don't know a tipping point until you're looking at the back of it. We won't know these things till we hit them. So why play dice with God when we, when there's a huge uh, uh, number of people with a great uh, 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 amount of scientific evidence? We don't have to be 99% sure to take certain measures. Uh, so I'm a realist, but I think that, uh, and, I, and I think talking about uh, 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 seven years from now, it'll be all over, I think is false. All right. But we shouldn't hold it against scientists who have overstated and have been Cassandra's. I remember uh, studying uh, the population time bomb, I think, by uh, uh, Paul Ehrlich back in 1970 in college. Mm. And it was pretty much saying that the world was going to but be so overpopulated it was going to fall out of orbit and in 20 on years shoulders yep. yeah these, these things haven't happened but that's not a reason for uh, a businessman or a skeptic to ignore the the new evidence and the greater things that are happening seven and a half or eight billion people please let's get real mm. I don't agree with the half Earth idea. You know, half of the whole the planet should be pristine. But it's, let's just use some common sense here. People, absolutely, seven and a half billion people is too much. Look at our look at our society. What's happening to us? So, so you think there's a carrying capacity? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's interesting. You know, I think people, um, yeah, like you just mentioned, Paul Ehrlich's thing, I think he was a butterfly specialist. Um, and you know, continue, I think it was like 2010, people are going to be standing on each other's shoulders with the food supply is going to decrease. We're going to run out of food. Um, yet why we are humans and why we're born naked is because we are people of tools. We have always been people of tools. We will always build things and innovate around them. And it is interesting to me what is about to come in the minds because of something like an Earth Day that have inspired or an Earth X that have inspired, you know, generations to come. And I really think that's such a crucial role to have these conversations and bring people to the table. Now, Trammell, you said you're a realist. You're on the Real Ears podcast. So the question for you today is, what is your definition of a real leader? Hmm. It makes you think of someone who really has great power and great influence. But a real leader is someone that people will emulate and follow. That can be a, a, well, you know, Mahatma Gandhi was a real leader. Uh, Real leaders aren't the leaders who have the agenda of uh, glory and and victory and defeating other people and their own uh, uh, sense of importance. Real leaders are people who are selfless, selflessly and tirelessly devoted to their cause. Beautifully put, Chandler Swan. Appreciate you coming on the Real Ears podcast today. We have a few questions from some fans chiming in. If you'll stay on, uh, but for Trammell Crow Jr., I'm Kevin Edwards. Asking to go out there, be selfless, follow and pursue the right thing, and always, folks, keep it real. Trammell, pleasure having you on the show today. Thank you.